Jesus himself always made reference uh, to his supernatural power of working miracles leading up then to be resurrecting from the dead. And I always find this interesting too. When in the temptation scene, the devil came to him because he had a body. And I think that this is true, that already Jesus was already preparing uh, the resurrection when he first said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. After baptism, he goes and he's tempted immediately. And the devil thinks he's just, you know, he was fooled because the devil's proud. He thought, here's another human being. Here's another, you know, like John the Baptist. I'm going to go up to him and I'm going to tempt him with this bread. And after 40 days of fasting, miraculously, miraculously, he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he's referring to himself as the ologos, the word there too. But the devil doesn't get it. And he's, you know, he gives him more temptations of showing him all the kingdoms of the world and, and jump from the pinnacle of the temple and all of that. And every time he rejects it, and I think that the blamelessness of Christ is shown and, the, and the, the fear of the devil, he leaves him until an opportune moment because he knows he was dealing with somebody that was already chasing him, chasing him down. Because then later on, he does multiply the loaves of bread and fishes for the people. That miracle, I am the bread of life, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, as Father talked about very precisely and beautifully yesterday. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. All these are predictions that he's giving that are going to result in the resurrection. And they are Tremendous, if you look at the, the devil was to flight all the time. What have you to do with us, son of man? They, they go into the pigs, the gathering swine. They do anything they can to run away from him. Far before he got to the, to the cross, he used the sword of his own divinity to slay the serpent all the way through. He raised the dead. Three times, right? Jairus, the son of Nain, and Lazarus. And every time it became more powerful as he did it. More dramatic. And that's it. Now there are forecasts in, in the Old Testament of Jesus resurrecting. And that, who, would, who would be the people I would mention in the Old Testament directly having to do with raising the dead? Yes. Who else? Elisha and Elias. They rose, and I'll give you the I'll give you the scripture verses: one Kings seventeen, chapter seventeen, and two Kings chapter four. Talk about the resurrection of these children, like Jairus' daughter. And then there is the confidence of Job in the resurrection from the dead, and I think this is a real hidden gem and diamond in the Old Testament, let me quote, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, then my flesh, in my flesh, I shall see God. And that is from Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. A direct quote about the resurrection in the midst of his terrible suffering. Suffering, resurrection. And it's always that way throughout the whole scriptures. The children of Israel suffer in Egypt, but they're saved when they get to the promised land. The people of the, the ancient world die in the flood, but Noah is saved, each for a new covenant, each for a new relationship with God until we get to the final ones, even today when you celebrated the liturgy of the blessed Anna, the mother of God, that becomes the new beginning, as all the hymns say, of the whole new humanity. Then in Psalm 16, 9 through 10, and I would advise everyone to read at least one psalm every day. And if you get to a longer psalm, read uh, three verses at least of that psalm. I'll be very specific. Do it every day. 
You will never know when those psalm verses will come to you. When the thoughts of my heart are many, thy consolations cheer my soul. You will find that these psalms come to you because they're really God's word speaking now in your heart. So please do it. Psalm 16, 9 through 10. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also dwells secure. My body dwells secure. We believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. We don't believe he was just a phantom or a specter or a ghost or his, or his psyche, his psychology or his spirit resurrected. His whole body resurrected. That is so important because I don't know, in any ethnic culture, we hug everybody. I mean, we have to hold them. They belong to us. I mean, that's why Jesus said, said not yet, Mary Magdalene. Don't, don't hold me yet. Because that was her first instinct. He comes as a bodily person. And so it's so great. I know that in my body will, will dwell secure. I'm so happy about that. Because you have to recognize the people you love. Yes, Father. What would he let Mary there's all kinds of uh, thoughts about that, that he hasn't yet ascended to his father. Um, I think he was waiting to confirm to the apostles that he was risen until he allowed that touching of him. So she was the first one he encountered but he had to confirm the resurrection for the apostles so that they could fulfill their role as being successors to him on earth. And so he had to go to first things first. But I don't think it was, it was forever that way because Thomas then touched him. The first one who was allowed to touch him was an apostle. Does that mean he had been to the Father then? Well... He hasn't yet ascended to the Father, but the Father had accepted, I believe, the sacrifice of Christ right away because it says even in the hymnology, Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for to thee belong all the nations. So, of course, that was an accepted thing, but he hadn't yet ascended to the Father in his uh, glorious resurrection, in his glorious body yet. He was still there to confirm the fact that he was bodily resurrected. So it seems to me that there is a, uh, a yet not a fullness. I don't know, fathers, if you would, uh, anyone else would want to comment on that. What do you think? Because I always found it to be a little bit uh, uh, abnormal for Mary not to be allowed to touch him, and yet Thomas was asked to touch him, and he went through closed doors. Because uh, I think of that in our own body after the resurrection. If it is to be glorified body, it would be just like the body that Christ rose with or something different. Well, the risen body still, it was a glorified body, but it, 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 it still had, it wasn't on the throne at the Father's right hand in the, quite that same, I would say, it was it accommodated the people for where they were so that they could, she could recognize him that way. Because if you notice, Jesus allowed them to recognize him in different ways. So he adjusted his presentation of self to them in a way that they could handle his father. Just a, a thought on St. Thomas touching him into his side, the, the hymns teach us that, you know, because he wasn't there when the Lord breathed on him and said and gave him the authority, the apostolic authority to get her to find and release hymns, that when he touched him, he received the authority that they had received when Christ breathed on him. And so there may be something to... That's what I thought. ...touching the body of Christ that has to do with apostolic authority. And I think it all, that's my first thought, Father, but I'm not saying that's dogmatic. It's still, in a sense, 
I would have to research that more, but I've always had a little puzzlement myself, and I can ask some sources. But I do think it had to do with the apostolic succession, because you know, even in the Greek, it calls there's only one time it, it, the, the, that Jesus' body is called soma, or body. Usually, it's called sarkikos, or of the flesh. So the soma has to do with take, eat. This is my body. Do this, all of you. This is my blood. It has to do with the Last Supper. So the fact that the apostles were then to distribute or in the sacrament of Holy Communion give that body of Christ, they had to be the first ones conceived to touch that body, in a sense. So maybe that has something to do with that. Because they're then the ones who are to rightly divide the word of faith, that truth that comes also to the apostolic succession. So I think there's a direct connection between the resurrection of Christ the touching of the body and the distribution of the body and blood in Holy Communion and be, you know, in lieu of his, resur his ascension into heaven. And, and also, when you said that he adjusted his presentation according to who he was talking to, in the Transfiguration we saw that too. Yes. He only revealed his transfigured self to certain people. And no, it's interesting if we want to continue that line since we're on this line. that you notice that the bishops all dress the same. So now his, his glorified body is set. And when it comes to us as reflecting it materially, it's set. I always tell everybody when I, I, give, I give an explanation of all the garments I wear, and this one little girl said, if you put one more thing on, you'll disappear. Just one more, just one more piece. <laughs> and I said, that's right. Yeah, I disappear so he can appear. I'm in the background so he can be in the foreground. You know, I'm extinguished so that he can be distinguished. That's on tape. see? So now that body is set. It's the resurrection body that people recognize. And that's why orthodoxy has really been faithful. Really been faithful to the whole resurrection, not only in doctrine, but in liturgical presentation. Uh, I haven't yet ascended to my father. Thomas touches the body. The apostles distribute the body and blood of Christ. The uh, apostolic succession continues that do this in remembrance of me, amnamnesis continually, which is living presence of God before all creation. And then we have the resurrected Christ when the bishop comes down from the altar to the salia, he's now coming down to the body or to earth because the body represents the earth and the high place, the altar, represents heaven. So here I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. If you put one more piece on, you're going to disappear. Yes. Materially. And you know that in the eighth chapter of the book of Hebrews, for your information, and I think this is very important, very confirming of the Orthodox faith, it said Christ goes behind the veil to minister. No. The word is not minister, it's liturgos, means to do the liturgy. And that one celestial altar in innumerable human altars reflecting that one divine liturgy, which is the never-ceasing songs of praise to the glory of God, which is the fourth prayer, the lamp-lighting prayers of the priest. See? It all holds together. It holds together forever and ever. I love it. That's why I don't... I am way behind. <laughs> and so let me go to Psalm 17. As for me, I shall behold thy face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with beholding thy form. Again, body, 
secure in body, beholding thy form. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from Sheol. Restore me to life among those who go down to the grave. I brought, they're brought, you have to bring up the soul in order to give life to the body. And in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19, the dead shall live, their bodies shall arise. O dwellers in the, in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For thy dew is the dew of light. Jesus rising in that early morning. God bless you. And the dew of light, the dew on him, and the land of the shades will be let loose from the fall. That's beautiful. It's the dawn of the new day. The dew of the morning. That was said... 500 years before Christ was born. And then Isaiah, Ezekiel chapter 37. How many of you always, I love the reading, the Old Testament reading that we read, Holy Saturday Matins. So I prophesied and I was commanded, and as I prophesied, although they don't read it like this, there was a noise. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone into bone. And as I looked, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. That's the recreation, see? Uh, first, you know, in Genesis. And then he said, prophesy to the breath, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come in from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as I was commanded and the breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great host which anticipates also the second coming of Christ. But you see how important that is my brothers and sisters that you're, you're resurrected. By the way, just as an aside you know how people ask us about cremation. I find it very interesting as I was going through the Old Testament Joseph said uh, to his sons before he passed, make sure you take my bones to Bethlehem. There's something in the bones. See, the, the, the you know, the cremation. Let me see. Let me see. Now this, I, I'm just telling you. There's something to it. When, in chapter 3, verse 24 of Genesis, it says, and God then gave them garments of skin, the garments of skin are kind of particular, different kind of than the structural stuff that we have, which is composed of bones. And we had a glorified body at one time that was different than the skin body that were given after sin in 324. So that body, some of the structural of our personal self, is contained somewhat in the bones. So there was the carrying of the bones to the, to the grave and the unearthing of the bones. Even in the ossuaries of the monasteries, there's something in the maintenance of that. And then if you want to, re I'm really pushing this, you may not want to distribute this on Ancient Faith Radio. <laughs> <laughs> but I really think there's something to that. If you think the DNA is in the marrow of the bones, so there's not only a material DNA, there's a spiritual DNA. There, there's a coming together of uh, my resurrection body with my material body post lapsarian after the fall. I just found it interesting. I'm not going to push that in a doctrinal way, but it's very because all the all the patriarchs insist that they be buried in in the field of that Abraham purchased, and then. You find it to be Hebron, which is seven miles from Jerusalem, which where there was the building of the temple, which then became the place of Jesus' crucifixion, where not a bone of him was broken. Scintillating. We shouldn't, we should honor with reverence the holy practices of the church.
to the best of our ability, realizing our situations and conditions in the world which may mitigate at times these. But let us never get rid of the general ways. That's it. Okay. And then in Daniel chapter 12 verse 2, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and that some to everlasting shame. And then, of course, there's all kinds of references of Jesus. So these are the prophecies and others in the Psalms that I can't go over now because I don't have that much more time and I want to get to the psychology of the resurrection that you can, that Jesus mentions and refers to himself as being the one who was prophesied all the way through to that time. You know, my brothers and sisters, I do constantly think of these things. And so they are doctrinal, but they're also interpretive to me. But I think they're right. But I'm not going to, I'm not St. Basil the Great, St. John Christ. I'm not that. But it's beautiful to reflect on all these things that Jesus has given us. That's me, excuse me. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Sorry about that. I've had that on, that, that, I've had a tough day. That way. Lots of calls. This is a, you're going to have to really edit this. <laughs> so let me now go to, yeah, Father. Uh, can we add some time to your allotted time? I don't know. I'm the bishop, I can do it. I mean, we'd rather listen to you. <laughs> I can do it. Lord have mercy. But uh, I, 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 didn't want, I didn't want Paul to uh, get off his schedule because I know you're doing so many good things here. So I know I... I, I can be a schedule. We're loving this piece. All right. So then it says two direct references in Hosea, chapter uh, 6 and verse 2. After two days I will revive us, and on the third day I will rise up. Direct reference, Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. And then in Hosea chapter 13, verse 14, Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your destruction? Hosea 13, 14, and also in Romans chapter 11, when at the, the last two verses, St. Paul quotes Hosea in reference to the resurrection. Now, I know these are a lot of scriptures for you. You're not going to look them up. But I just want to confirm historically that this is why Jesus claimed what he did. And... Many people, now this is a confirmation also in sense, 5,000 people were converted in the book of Acts, and then 3,000 people after, 8,000 people within the first four chapters, they responded quickly because they referred, because they were Jewish, most of them, to these scripture verses. So it was the fact that the truth about Christ as being the true Messiah was suppressed by Sanhedrin influence. They knew. It was just they wanted to maintain their power. Unfortunately. But many of the, the Jewish people that heard him, they believed. In fact, many of the Pharisees believed. The first, the, the chastisement that Jesus gave them in the 23rd chapter of Matthew was preparation for forgiveness. Because when the gospel was finally preached, 
beautifully by St. Peter, uh, unbelievably by St. Peter. After Pentecost and on Pentecost, they converted en masse. And that's why there was controversy in chapter 7 of the book of Acts with the Hellenists. Because they felt they owned the resurrection. The Pharisees. Because they felt they owned everything. You know, because they were powerful. You know, to be a good Pharisee, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible, the whole Pentateuch, word for word. With the commentaries of the elders. So they were an elite spiritual force. And they could never, they could never do anything but bow before the Lord Jesus Christ when they asked him about the law. And he gave them that beautiful answer. You shall love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor as thyself. And the lawyer says, he has spoken well, Sayyidna, Master, recognizing him as the master. That's what made it sad. Part of it, their beautiful Lord, Savior. I don't know, there are depictions of Christ, you know, by uh, Roman sources from eyewitnesses of when he was in the world. They said he was a perfectly balanced, tall man who never really laughed out loud, but had that, that sense of humor and harmony in what he did. And he was never distracted from being with people. And he was never exhausted from teaching. They had all these things. And that he had the color of hair that David had, red. Gray. It's not the same. Red. And, and they had that, that perfect presence of his humanity. And they said, a uh, beautiful human being was the last line of one of the things I read. Beautiful human being. So Jesus had that sensitivity to all the people, and yet he was still crucified. Anyway, by the time you get to the resurrection, they had already read these over again. And if you even think about St. Paul, who was the great Pharisee, about he had a dramatic uh, encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, 9th, 16th, and reprinted again, I think, in the 26th chapter of Acts. But he confirmed it himself from what he knew of the scriptures to be. And then you have Matthew 22, verse 32. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He is not here. He is risen. Christ is risen. Luke chapter 24, 6. That's all confirmation of the prophecies. Because remember, Jesus said in the 24th chapter of Luke that he opened to them the scriptures in two places, especially 44 through 47. Uh, Luke chapter 24, 44 through 47, he opened up to the apostles all these scriptures that I'm giving to you now. Plus, they had the added power of him being right there with them. And then Jesus always mentions the resurrection. And he even used Lazarus' death to talk about his resurrection, as we all know, preceding Holy Week. Your brother will rise again. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. All right. So these scriptures continue over and over. And just to underscore the fact of resurrection, um, let me read Corinthians, because Jesus didn't only appear just to the apostles. He appeared to other people, too. It says, For I delivered to you, as I mentioned before, of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, Peter and to the twelve. And why do you think he appeared to Peter? Why is Peter mentioned first? He denied him three times, but also... Peter was the first one to confess him, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He confirmed the priority 
and the hierarchy in an interesting way. Not hierarchy as supremacy over, but hierarchy as elder brother within. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because there's a difference. If it's, if it's supreme jurisdiction, that's not orthodox. If it's primacy of honor, that's orthodox. So we maintain that primacy right there. He comes to Peter, but beautifully he comes to Peter because he knows, he says, Peter, do you love me? He'd have him reverse that privately. There's a, there's a story about Saint Sergius of Radanesh that kind of parallels this. Though it just came in my head, thank God that that's true. Has that ever happened to you and you start speaking with people? Things just connect? That's the God spirit working, I believe. But it was always said of Saint Sergius that when any of the monks did something wrong, he would never chastise them in front of anyone else. But then after everything was done and the day was done, he would knock at the door over and over until they answered. And finally he would say, you know who this is. <laughs> and they would open the door and come in and then he would tell them what they did wrong. But in, <laughs> but in this case, uh, Jesus was, for, was showing the love that he had for the, weak, the weakness in the flesh that Peter had. And beautifully in Mark's gospel too, because a lot of people during the time of, of the persecutions under Nero and, uh, and, uh, and, and, the, and the succeeding uh, Roman emperors, they needed consolation because there was some falling away. And it says in the book of Mark, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So it's a way for people to come back, and, and even Peter needed to come back. Do you love me? Three times, and he confirmed that love, and he became that great apostle. But how great is our Lord, that he ri raises, rises from the dead, goes and talks to the friend, because it's his friend. I mean, how many of us has, have been disappointed by friends? How many had really close friends, relatives that, out of their weaknesses, Lord have mercy. They really hurt us. But the greatness of God. You know I love you. And I can see Jesus smiling and saying, take your place. Because Peter could have taken his place because he was a called apostle. But he wouldn't have had a free heart to do. He wouldn't have been able to freely love until he received back the love that he felt he gave away. You know, there's a story about that. It was said that whenever the rooster crowed in the morning for the rest of his life, he wept. And then, when they were going to crucify him, he said, Crucify me upside down. Because I don't deserve to die the way my Lord did. Not, don't take me, don't not kill me, but just do it in a more humble way. So, you know, that, that's the, the real beauty of, of that situation. So then he appeared to Cephas, because he had to. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. And most of whom are still alive. So when Paul was writing this letter to Corinthians, most of them had seen the risen Lord. Over 500 did with the apostles, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all to one untimely bore, he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles. But I love what St. Paul does next. He too to, true to be a real Pharisee. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, on the contrary, I worked harder than all of them.
So I'm not going to stay in the, in the depths too long. <laughs> On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that dwells within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed, and so you're saved, and so, you know, there really is a happy ending. So, that's that. Because now, they, in a way, they needed him because of his impetuous nature. And, they, and he was the first one to speak at Pentecost. He's the first one to get in trouble all the time. And you, you ever, you know, sometimes we follow the person that's the first to take the initiatory act, the first one to do something. And then after that, we all follow them. And I don't even know if John would have run ahead of Peter if Peter wasn't running behind him. You ever want to be with, you know, because they know that there's somebody back there following up on me. You ever have little kids? Oh, I don't have kids. You all, how many of you have children? Some of us grow older, but not up. <laughs> That's why I enjoyed the French fries this afternoon. But, you know, so little ones, I noticed because I have this niece, Rebecca, which I just adore. I don't have kids, but if I had kids, I would have spoiled them really bad. I took care of her once when she was two and a half years old, completely charmed me in every way. She looked like my mom. Lord have mercy, what do you do then? <laughs> what do you do then? Whatever she wants. <laughs> so, <laughs> she, she used to do everything wrong and I let her do it and uh, she would keep me up all night reading eight books. And I couldn't leave the room. She'd start crying. I went back and read another book. You're not supposed to do that. My, my brother said that it took him two weeks to get her back to normal. But the reason I mention the story is not all of that, because it's not on the resurrection, but mentioning that Peter ran behind him, to, 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 and then John was running ahead of him. This is just a speculation. Because little kids run ahead of you, and they always look back, just to make sure you're running behind them. So I think that's true, that Peter, he was that, that real spoke in the wheels that made that, that wheel go forward. Yeah. Uh, the question I have is, I was at a talk once where the speaker said, Christ became man without any compromise. And uh, I guess what I wonder is what that implies about what a human being is. Because how can Christ become man? You know, I, I think I think of myself as too low, perhaps. You know, that God could, could become man without compromise? Well, I think without compromise, without corruption, without, you know, the sin, that, because human nature was compromised so that Jesus didn't compromise the humanity because he took a sinless humanity. So that's what I would say the answer is that way. He, so uh, in a sense, there is sort of a compromise? Yeah, we're compromised. When we're born of the old seed, we're compromised already. We're born with the... Uh, with the germ of death. We're born with a sense of corruption. We're born with a sense of self-preservation. That's why we become a defensive. You ever think of that? Very early in life, we're very defensive. We become security conscious. We become pleasure driven. All that is because we're afraid to die. It says in the second chapter of Hebrews, chapters 14 through 15, uh, and because of death, and, um, and because of death, all men, that's, that's 514 of Romans, it says, and um, because of the fear of death, all men sin. See, there's a fear of death. And that is what really motivates the compromised human nature. How do you live out the um, Sermon on the Mount? Look at the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. Uh, do not be anxious for today, for the day will be anxious for itself. People don't live that way. They're anxious. I mean, you know, they're anxious to maintain all of the things we want to keep security. Well, that's motivated by the compromised nature. Right? Yes, Father. Would it also mean compromise concept that we're sin polluted and we are imperfect? Yep, that would include that. Yeah. So therefore the new Adam Jesus 
Yep. Who said was imperfect. And yes, and perfectly courageous and didn't fear that he would not go into, we all fear kind of oblivion. Remember those old TVs? At the end of the day, they would just narrow into that little thing. And then you say, okay, it's all gone. It's dark now. You know, I have, I hope that I have given you some of that historical background and the spiritual basis. Now I'm going to go to the psychological um, need for the resurrection. I believe that, and this is a, Every person has an inside, inner longing to be good and to express a sensitivity about the way things ought to be. In our lives, we always run up to, to that uh, conflict between, I know this is the way it should be, but this is the way it is. And we get depressed if we see somebody who is not living well becoming successful or read Psalm 73 or Psalm uh, 37, we always have that sense of oughtness, as C.S. Lewis said. All of us want to feel good. Now, but, but when man sinned, he, he was put into a world where this idea of fulfilling my own goodness, of being who I really am, being very difficult and very elusive, we try to find out who I am by collecting what I do's. <laughs> I mean, sometimes somebody said, uh, I'm not a human doing, I'm a human being. But we try to collect a bunch of what we do to explain who we are. Because we don't really know who that center is. We, we are fishing, like the fisherman analogy. Who, what can I offer the world that's distinctly mine? Where can I find that? secret hidden person of my heart which wants to contribute to the greater good, which wants to participate in the creative act of God. All creation groans in travail until the revealing of the sons of God. And it always seemed to me that what it means is we have to give something that's specially ours in some way to the world. I think deep down we have that feeling. So co we collect what I do's and what I have instead of who I am. Once there was this movie uh, that I believe it was that John Travolta was in it called, um, I don't know, a criminal, uh, something about a court case. I don't know what it was, uh, some criminal justice or something like, I don't know what it was, but it was about uh, this big corporation that bought up a bunch of land and it, they polluted the land, but because the corporation was so big, a class, it was called class action. It was a class action suit that he brought. He was this little lawyer with two other lawyers, and he brought that against that big thing, and he spent all his money, and, and he, he ended up going to a bankruptcy court himself because all he had left was, I think, $15 and a radio. And the judge asked him, what did you do with all your sins that give you, with all your things that give you an identity? And that was a powerful line at the end, with all the things that give you your identity. So that's what I said. We, we end up being mixed up between the who I am's and the what I do's and, and the what I have's. So we are split down the middle. If I pursue who I am, I fear I might lose all my stuff of all that I have. People do that. They have a sense of, I think I'd like to leave this, but if I leave it, I don't know what I'm going to get on the other side of it. I, if we reduce our risks, we reduce our rewards. It's a quotable thing. Yep. You know, if we rest from our risks, we won't get the reward. Maybe even more precise. And we rest because we're fearful. We're caught in the middle. Who I am? What do I have? So people can go and get a job and do really well with the what's and the haves, but not have a clue as to who they are. Because they live in the fallen world, see? And they're trying to realize full perfectibility. When Jesus said, be thou perfect, 
Even as the Heavenly Father was perfect, he was talking about a continual self-sacrificial life. And as a fallen person, how do you become sacrificial when you've got to be defensive and you've got to preserve your life so you're caught. You're caught in the middle. You're caught like a fly in a trap. It's a psychological difficulty. If you live only for the now and the temporary life that the world preaches today, how are you going to resolve the inner conflict in the very depth of your being? Because it's wrong to run away from the mystery you can't find. <laughs> Do you understand what I said? It, you know by heart you know what I said is right. Sometimes you stay up at night and you wonder what that mystery means. Sometimes you look at your husband and say, I love him, but I really don't know him. After 22 years of marriage. Now I'm spooking you in a good existential way. <laughs> and that's because there's something in you that wants to remain true to the mystery you haven't found about who you are. You have to remain true to that mysterious center of primary value which even though anyone else can't see it, you know it. And without the resurrection, you won't find it. I don't know how many of you have had days where you, and you wondered where your time went. You did so many details that never came together that you kind of think you're an alien to your own self. What happened to this day? And in those fugitive moments of your life, when their things are quiet, God, what happened to it? That's good. Anxiety is good. It's good to be stretched, not stressed. <laughs> mm. Those routines sometimes camouflage and cover off this what I'm talking about, this split in us. We want the impossible. We want to lose our isolation in that fearful fugitive moment. And we want to keep it at the same time. We want someone to respect our kind of mercurial searching for the mystery. And we want somebody to say, no, that's not right at the same time. We want to merge with someone greater than us. And we want to emerge to be only us. We want to be distinctive, but we want to be obliterated. We want to be all things at all time, even though both those things are contradictory. That's what St. Paul said in the seventh chapter of Romans. That which I do not want to do is the thing that I do, and that which I do is the very thing I do not want to do. For that which is in my eye, I know what to do, but in my flesh I cannot do it. Cannot, cannot do it. So he's in the same perplexity. And then he goes on to chapter 8. Thank God for those who are in Christ have no condemnation. First verse. And then who are in the Spirit, living according to the Spirit. And his whole life is changed. Resurrection changed. Because that contradiction eventually harmonizes when you have a whole eternity to work on it. And when Jesus is going to show it to you in the resurrected body, gradually, 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 until you shine like the sun. 13th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Without that, my brothers and sisters, we can't complete our lives. We can't escape depression. We can't repress it until we express it, or otherwise we'd be depressed by it. If you repress that uniqueness of who you are long enough, and you're not able to express it, you'll get depressed. Depression is an early warning signal. It's being violated. 
Does this sound kind of, this is new to you or what? Is this, it's kind of odd for a bishop to, but it's the psychological point is important for you. I want you to realize that. Like, when you choose to get into relationships with people, uh, find out the ones who will honor you, even when they don't understand you. Isn't that what we love about good parents and good friends? When my parents passed on from this life, I had these odd sensitivities. I would walk down neighborhoods and wonder, where's my home? I don't know if you've had that poignancy in your life. Where do I go now? Where's that familiar room? Where is that expected place where no matter what I am, what I've done, I'm first. I'm first. And so there's that sense of, I would say you don't get over it, you get around it. They're with God and they, they guide you and that's very true, but there's that sense of who you are being honored. And even when we don't make the right choices or when it takes us a long time to make the choice. You know, be patient with your kids. Maybe they don't know what to do in, in their undergraduate lives or if they're going to even go to college, but let them work out the mystery of their own struggle with good direction. Not just let them float. Let them, let them struggle a little. Struggle with them to find that mystery of what I'm talking about. And maybe if they'll find their way. Never give up on them finding their way. Never give up on them finding their way back to the church too, because the church will always be here when they want to come back to it. Because Christ is eternal and this is his eternal body and he's not going anywhere. And, it, and there was a, a Protestant hymn once, you may know it. Oh, how the ransom never knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how long the the night that the Lord went through before he saved his sheep that were lost. Yeah, so this is what I'm talking about, this great mystery of the who I am. And let me go further. How can a person take his private being and, and enrich himself and others in a distinctive way? What he's called to be and what he wants to be is a hero, a superhero. And the only, and if we're made in the image and likeness of God, and he ascended to the Father, and he went through everything he did, and he made us a logi, to be like the logos, a word to be like the word, then we're going to be triumphant like him. Like, we can even look at his whole life as our going through our different crosses and struggles. But let us not be afraid to be alone in our own uniqueness, perched on Golgotha, with everybody to see us, and everybody to complain about us, and everybody to compliment us, and a few people to stay with us, and then when we're resurrected, we're going to complete our whole life. Because let me say something very profound. Jesus still didn't fulfill his whole mission until he ascended. And in a sense, he hasn't completed it, yes, until he comes again at his second and glorious coming. So it's not finished. Even he's in the process of finishing and fulfilling and completing the whole plan of the Father for him. So we shouldn't just tire of the fact that we haven't found that great who we are yet. We should keep looking for it. And if there's a cross on the way, okay, you set it up, you do whatever you want on the external way, but we're going to keep going forward, keep going in the direction of God, following that, well. We find a great conflict then. If I give myself a powerful beyond that transcends me and a sacrificial love, do I risk that I won't ever come away from it? I'll just be merged with another person? Or, or do, do I really find that this could be something I live for? Who are those people that God will have me encounter so that gift can be realized? What form will my creativity give to the world and how do I recognize that? These are basic questions
that only eternity can answer. Questions that we can't run away from. Don't run away from them. If they're hunting you, good. Stretched, but not stressed. Even if you're stressed, that's still okay. Have some sleepless nights with it. Wrestle with it. And then the way you guarantee, it's the last thing I'm going to say, the way you guarantee that that special uniqueness of who you are, that only you can give to the world, as one great elder once said to a man who asked him the question about what he should do, the elder merely said, if you don't do it, who will do it? And that is true. If you don't do it, who will do it? If you aren't that which you are to be, who will be? He doesn't make another one. Face it. Face the fear of living up to your own potential. A lot of people don't want it. It's too hard. Too hard to climb. Get on Golgotha. Wait for the resurrection. Wait for the ascension. Wait for the second coming. Wait for your eternity. But the way to guarantee it is to follow the commandments of Jesus Christ. He gives you apprehension of who you are so that you can have a comprehension of what he wants you to know about him so that you can complete it by acting on those commandments. This is the formula. If you want to find out who you are, you have to know who he is. The way you know who he is is by doing what he wants you to do. The way you know what he wants you to do is by reading the Sermon on the Mount chapters 5 through 7 of the book of Matthew. Read it over and over again. It's a good catechetical summary of following the commandments of Christ. When you match the commandments with that inner mystery of who you are that I'm talking about, then the who and the what and the have and everything else that is in your life come together in, apropos to the sacred music people, perfect harm. <laughs> Well, that's the lecture.